Well, good afternoon. Thank you for being here, and um, I appreciate this chance to share with you um, what we referred to as the State of the University Address, and we did this a year ago. And um, today, I, I want to focus on our new strategic plan, point out some things we've done well, uh, where we plan to invest uh, additional resources, and where we really want to be by 2025. But before I get into that, I want to make a few introductions. I want to begin with the, uh, by introducing our Chancellor, Robert Duncan. Thank you for being here. You can hold your, please hold your applause until they've all been introduced. <laughs> uh, Prov um, Provost Mike Gallion, uh, a year ago at this time, uh, uh, we were doing searches that have resulted in several new uh, positions being filled. And I must say how much I appreciate the great work that Provost Gallion is doing. Um, we were doing searches, I think, for three deans at this time a year ago. I'm very pleased to introduce Jack Mallon, who is the new dean of the College of uh, School of Law. Um, Margaret Williams had an air some uh, plane problems and couldn't be here. Uh, I'm very pleased to introduce our new Vice President of Research, Joe Hebert, who comes to us from the University of Kansas. I'm sure he's not, he's probably glad he's not there right now, <laughs> if he was a football fan. <laughs> it, it is a beautiful campus. The, the only thing that they have on us is topography. They have a few hills, but it is wonderful. I want to introduce Dr. Elizabeth Sharp, who is the Interim Vice President uh, for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Uh, we created a new position for Title IX Coordinator, and that is now filled by Dr. Kimberly Simone. And I think that is, and also I need to acknowledge our Chief Financial Officer, Vice President for Administration and Finance, Noel Sloan. Um, I especially want to thank all the deans for being here the great work they do for Texas Tech. And there were also 85 new faculty that have joined Texas Tech since a year ago. And I'm now going to introduce all of them. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I probably should. Um, so let me, so today, uh, a year ago at this time, oh, um, we had announced the formation of a committee to begin looking at a revision of our strategic plan. The existing plan went from 2010 to 2020, and we wanted to revise that plan going out to 2025, which will be the 100th birthday of the first class at Texas Tech, um, 100th anniversary, and our 100th birthday is in 2023. And um, as a result of that, um, and the work of 27 faculty, students, staff, and community members, they have produced a new document that will be released in the coming weeks. It's still being fine-tuned. It was presented to the board in May. Um, now you can say, how excited can I get about a strategic plan? It seems like there's always a new one. But what I would hope people will become excited about is the discussions that will take place at the college and departmental levels as the provost begins a rollout of this plan. That is where the real substantive behavior occurs as you try to attain the benchmarks that are in this plan, but you decide for yourselves where your own areas of excellence are as they support the broader vision of the university. Uh, that said, uh, you know, in, beyond the specific success of students and faculty, I think we have to do a better job of marketing what it is we do at Texas Tech. And so last year, we engaged uh, a firm and, uh, to help us tell that story of what the students do, what the faculty do, what this great institution is about. Um, and, and I'm gonna begin with that, but first let me begin with those three strategic priorities. There were five, and you might recall the first strategic priority of the old plan was grow enrollment. It's been replaced by educate and empower a diverse student body. Enable innovative 
researching creative activities, and transforms lives in communities through strategic outreach and engaged scholarship. And I'm going to elaborate a bit about these goals as we go forward. But um, when I was talking about marketing what we do, we started a campaign last summer. It's called Degrees of Impact. Every month, we've been sending out a postcard that goes to around 900 to 1,000 schools. It goes to presidents, provosts, deans, vice presidents of research. And we feature you know, a faculty member or some activity every month. The most recent one was the one in the corner uh, that relates to the work that people in the Department of Geosciences, in particular atmospheric sciences, were doing with uh, Harvey when that struck the coast of Texas. Um, we also um, created a web page. It's, it's called Degrees of Impact, and you can, it, a memo went out some time ago. But we've created stories of faculty. I think there's six or seven there now. We'll be adding to those throughout the year. And I want to give you a sample of the kind of message we're trying to convey. You want to play that, Chris? Let me show you a special place where people are creating degrees of impact every day. Researchers and innovators in biochemistry, agriculture, water, and wind technology. Leaders in business and engineering. Artists achieving national and global recognition. Athletes making a difference on and off the field. And alumni changing their communities in meaningful ways. All connected by a special place called Texas Tech. That sound seemed a bit messed up to me, but I hope you got the spirit of it. And this is a special place. And that's the message we want to convey. And uh, we have a great story to tell. Um, what I'm going to propose and what I want to suggest is that by 2025, when you get beyond the specifics of the strategic plan, Texas Tech needs to be solidly positioned as a top 50 national research university as determined by those public research institutions in the Carnegie Highest Research Activity category. There are 81 of those schools now. And at the end of this presentation, I'm going to share with you some metrics that show how we compare to those. It's an ambitious goal, but it's a realistic goal. And that goal will depend on certain achievements of our students, the support of our staff and faculty, uh, metrics that relate to the full breadth of academic activities that go on here. With, with that, let me get into um, uh, some of the things that we've done in the last year. Uh, we had several notable firsts and records. Um, so we had a, cons uh, a record enrollment for the 10th consecutive year. It was distinguished by the largest freshman class we've ever enrolled, nearly 5,900 students. Um, the graduate enrollment was down slightly, uh, partially impacted by international issues. We intentionally decided to decrease the size of the law school to focus on raising the LSAT scores, the GPA, because we feel, above all, the law school brings us reputation, not necessarily just bodies. Um, this was, um, uh, this class had another, distingui well, another distinguishing characteristics for this fall. We had a record retention. 84.1% is the highest retention we've ever had at Texas Tech. Um, that is one of our highest third year retentions uh, rates at 68.8. What has been disappointing is we have not really moved the, the mark on six-year graduation rates. Uh, we've been hovering around 60% uh, for many years. But if you look at the third-year rate, the increased second-year rate, it does project for an increased graduation rate. Our goal at Texas Tech is to have a one-year retention rate of 90% and a six-year graduation rate of 70%. Those are basically the, um, goal, those are the, uh, the benchmarks of those 81 public institutions in the Carnegie Tier 1 class. 
we awarded a record number of degrees, nearly 7,800. That's, that's an amazing uh, number of degrees to award. And if you've attended graduation, you realize how large that number is. And I see Genevieve Durham there, and uh, she in the provost's office, along with support of many others, oversees our graduation ceremonies. And um, it's going to be a challenge to continue to do it as we do, but that's our goal. Um, we had a record number of doctoral degrees awarded, 346. Uh, according to the National Science Foundation, that puts us in about the top 10% of all graduate programs in the United States. Um, in the last five years, we have increased our full-time faculty by 21% and, and a, a similar increase for all faculty. In that five-year period, our enrollments increased by about 11%. Um, I find this next data uh, pretty impressive. I came to Tech in 1982. Not that that's impressive. <laughs> <laughs> I am pretty darn old. And you see, when I arrived here, we were 90% 90 uh, 90 of our students were white, 4.3% were Hispanic, and 1.9% were black, 2.2% were international. If you look at the national data, that is very close to the way it was across this country. 20 years later, we have made progress in growing our Hispanic enrollment, our black enrollment, and starting to increase our international. But in the ensuing 15 years, you see a dramatic change. Today, with over 37,000 students, we have fewer white students on campus today than we did in 1982. Uh, we're 25.3% Hispanic, nearly 6% African American, and our graduate enrollment, uh, our international enrollment is 8.3%. That represents, in the international enrollment, about a 40% increase since 2012. That's been a priority to grow all of the diversity on campus. Now, that 25.3% for Hispanic enrollment is including graduates. To be designated a Hispanic serving institution, you need to achieve at least 25% Hispanic enrollment among your under full-time student equivalent undergraduate. This fall, we were 27.8. So we've met the benchmark to be eligible as a Hispanic serving institution. And I suspect most of you have heard quite a bit about that. Um, it takes a fair amount of time for that to be substantiated, but in 18 months, we will have access to additional federal funding, such as Title III funding, which is primarily for stimulated activities, but Title V funding provides support for all students in terms of academic support services, and that will be a great advantage to this institution. Um, a year ago at this time, and I, I made this announcement in the State of the University address that we were going to put an additional $4 million into need-based scholarships and an equal amount into presidential scholarships. And I do believe that our enrollment reflects that strategy. Uh, we live in a state where 50% of the graduating high school students were Hispanic and more than 70% of all graduating high school students are first generation. I'm not saying that those first generation students are the, really the recipients of the need-based scholarship, but there is evidence that first generation students may not perform as well on standardized tests. And to give you some, ev some evidence of that, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I spoke to the Hisp Hispanic Student Association. There may have been 100 students there. I asked them, how many of you are first generation? I would estimate at least 80% raised their hand. A few days later, I was speaking to our national merit finalists on campus. There were about 40 in the audience. I said, how many of you are first generation? Three raised their hand. So we live in a state where we have to be cognizant of balancing need and merit scholarship. That said, in this year's class, the SAT 
of our Hispanic and African American students was up about 70 points compared to about a 50% increase for the overall population. And it was a different test. Uh, here is that data. So this year, we had a record number national merit finalists. You might say, you're really stretching it there, Skubanek, 16 compared to 15. The prior year was seven, and before that, we had never had more than five. So we have made a, a considerable difference in the recruitment of national merit. I mentioned the extra money that went to presidential scholars. These are students with an SAT of over 1,200 in the top 25% of their class. This year, we, had, we have enrolled on this campus more than 2,500. A year ago, over 1,100. That's a considerable difference. It goes to show you the importance of scholarship. And one thing, and I'm going to come to this later, one of our priorities is to increase our scholarship support. Um, Texas Tech, if you look at the various rankings, um, and I'm not going to get into that, I'll mention a few, where we fare well is when it takes into account return on investment and value. For instance, um, in the Forbes College rankings, which looks at cost, value, as well as student outcomes, we did move up 60, 65 places this year to 314 but they also do a ranking called best value. It includes all schools, private, publics. There's more than 3,000 baccalaureate institutions in the United States. And this is the first time Texas Tech ever achieved that top 300 ranking. They only list 300. Okay, we're 298, but we're there. And it speaks to the value of the institution. In something like payscale.com that looks at 20-year return on investment, Texas Tech is in the top 50 of public institutions. So it's important that we provide support to students so that when they do graduate, they're not encumbered with a lot of debt. Our average debt's about 22.5, and continue to provide the excellent education that we already give them. Um, now, let me list uh, the, the first, let me go back to that first priority. These are not ranked, they're all equally important. So educate and empower a diverse student body. These are some of the goals and some of the strategies that are part of that strategic plan. So we, we, we talk about delivering unique and transformative learning opportunities. Things such as undergraduate research, internships, service and experiential learning. The real detail of this really is at the department and college level, but an example of that would be a new program we started this year. We have our first class in the program for investigative thinking and inquiry. We also announced this last year at the, um, this address. We, we made a decision to take money from the National Research University Fund and put that into the support of undergraduate research. So we recruited about 100 students this year. We're going to do that for the next three years. We'll have a steady state value of about 400 students. They receive a stipend of $5,000 a year. And then there will be a stipend paid to the faculty. It's a $2.5 million commitment, but that's an example of what we mean by a transformative learning experience. These students are recruited. They're put in five different cohorts led by a particular faculty member covering the full breadth of academic areas. They learn about what, they, what faculty are doing when they come and give individual lectures. They learn about the ethics of research, the process of scholarly activity, and then they're paired with a faculty mentor. And you can never overstate the importance of those personal one-on-one -on -one relationships. That's what Texas Tech is famous for. That's what binds our graduates to this school, and that's the kind of thing we have to continue to do. Um, we're going to continue to focus on preparing our students to live in this very globally connected world. The QEP that we started a couple years ago is all about communicating in a global society. Uh, we're going to continue to emphasize international recruitment, study abroad. It's, it's, some colleges do that more than others, architecture, engineering, for example. Um, and um, 
to give you an update on Costa Rica, uh, that campus is scheduled to open next fall. The, the building is, I think, progressing very, very well. Um, about two weeks ago or three weeks ago, we received notice from the Southern Association of Colleges, Schools, Commission on Colleges, that the programs that we will be providing were uh, approved by SAC COC. So that was a major accomplishment. The recruiting students now, um, it's going to be a wonderful opportunity to provide a Texas Tech education for people in Costa Rica and Central America. It's going to be a gateway to the southern half of the Western Hemisphere, an important area for us. But also, it's going to be an opportunity for our students to go there and have study abroad experiences. There are many, many multinational corporations there. We've already, we're already in communication with many of those, and there'll be opportunities for our students to go there and work in their laboratories. And the last uh, note I've made here from this, first, uh, from this priority is that we want to provide a nurturing environment that promotes wellness and lifelong learning and success. And that's much more than words. We enroll students today that bring a lot of issues to this campus. We have to tend to the whole development of students, and we do that through the very many services we provide, and we must continue to enhance those services. Um, once we recruit these students, we advise them very aggressively. We need to provide a pathway to their next step in their life, whether that be graduate school or, um, in, or their, their, their career. Um, we, we made a commitment this year, and I'm going to, uh, this year, and I'm going to, that, to put additional resources into those kind of activities in light of this very large class. And so, in fact, let me turn to planned investments that relate to this strategic priority. Um, at Texas Tech, we have an endowment of about $660 million. The system endowment is slightly over $1.1 billion. About half of our endowment is for scholarships, and the other half is for professorships and operations. Uh, our goal, and we'll be launching this this year, is to raise an additional $200 million for scholarships. Uh, we're going to commit $5 million to match the payout that would usually be provided on the endowment proceeds, which is 4.5%. So for instance, if one of you want to give $110 million, the payout would be $5 million uh, normally, but we'll match that and provide uh, a $10 million payout, doubling the impact of that scholarship endowment. Uh, last year, we announced that we were going to create 25 endowed professorships for teaching excellence. Those nominations are now being taken in the provost's office, and we'll be filling the, the provost will be filling those, announcing those sometime this fall. Um, at the same time, we're looking for donors to fully in, endow those professorships so that the payout to the faculty member would be double what it's going to be, 5,000, it'd be 10 instead of five. I mentioned the program for investigative thinking and inquiry. We're going to continue to support that. Uh, we've made a commitment to put an additional one and a half million dollars into student support services this year in light of this large class. We've started to increase our retention rates, but we can't let up on that. Um, that's such an important issue in terms of measuring student success. Uh, one thing we started doing last year was going around to all the to, to departments, myself, uh, Noel, Noel, Mike, Grace, um, I think Jack, you should probably, uh, I mean, uh, not you, Jack, you don't have to, Joe, you should probably join us as well. And it's amazing, and I really appreciate the fact that the deans let us do that. And we maybe have visited now with 20 departments so far. We're going to visit another 20 this year. And one thing we learned is um, that we need to be more attentive to attending to infrastructure, classroom issues and such. So we've made a five-year commitment to put an additional $4 million each year into classrooms and classroom laboratories. And that process is ongoing and we'll continue to do that. Uh, I next want to turn to this strategic priority that deals with enabling innovative research and creative activities. Um, I'm going to be very brief 
on this because the real nuts and bolts of this is a discussion that takes place at the department on college level. When the provost engages the colleges and the departments, we'll be looking at the metrics we've established. We do have goals uh, that relate to all matters of scholarly activity. Um, but based on the input that was collected during the um, preparation of this strategic plan, there were certain areas that were identified as to where Texas Tech can be nationally renowned. And it fits very well with where we are and what we do. The interconnections of water, land, food, and fiber. Energy production, renewable, carbons, carbon as well, distribution and utilization technologies, health, well-being, and the quality of life. And then the inquiry and the creative expression across the arts, humanities, and science, sciences. And um, I know that when you put something like that down, it could be met with a certain degree of skepticism, like where's the beef? But I say engage, be engaged in those discussions when we follow up during the fall as we roll out this strategic plan and what we, what we can and want, want to do in these areas. I'm going to give you a few exemplary models of this. Of course, probably many of you are familiar with the Bear Crop Science Project Revolution. That was an investment through philanthropy of about 18, 19 million, matched through the Texas Research Incentive Program. Um, there's a new initiative coming out of human sciences and nutrition and, uh, and metabolic health. Uh, that facility is going to be located in the bank on 4th and, and 19th and University. And there's this project called the Texas Liberator witnessed the Holocaust. Uh, this is headed up, there are many people involved, but Lisa Wong has played a primary role in this. This is a fascinating endeavor that really illustrates um, so many qualities of what we want to promote. You have many disciplines, you have undergraduate researchers, you have graduate researchers, and you're engaging the state. And this is going to be rolled out in Austin later this month. Uh, the chancellor and I will go down for that. It's going to be, uh, look for more information about this, but it's a wonderful service to the state representing the engagement, what I would call engaged scholarship. And um, th this is the kind of research we want to be doing, research that addresses regional, state, national needs and engages uh, the community. You can't really talk about research without mentioning some metrics, at least I can't. And you might say, well, where's the data on publications and citations? Uh, creative uh, presentation, I mean, um, uh, presentations and such. We are trying, we are in the process of trying to better monitor the full breadth of academic uh, and scholarly and creative activities. But this is the, this is the low hanging fruit, so I have to show it to you. Um, so this year, we did have a record in total research expenditures, 184 million. Um, five years prior, it was 132. Um, if you go back to 2008, it was 50. Um, this is something that is tracked by the National Science Foundation and other ranking agencies, so it, it's, it's positive. What's probably more meaningful is what's called the restricted research expenditures. You cannot count institutional commitment when the state records your re restricted research expenditures. It's more than federal because it would include philanthropy or gifts from foundations. A year ago, we had a $7 million gift from the Gates Foundation related to te teacher preparation and a large private gift to a faculty member in physics. Uh, and so there, but this is also a record for Texas Tech, um, $61 million. You might recall that in order to gain access to the National Research University Fund, you had to meet the minimum of 45. And so far, only two schools in the state of the emerging research universities have done that, Texas Tech and Houston. What is um, disappointing is that we're making little progress in increasing our federal uh, research expenditures. 
money is it's hard to get that money. And you might say, well, why even the discussion of all of this? And I've, Joe and I were having a discussion on Friday how to cast this conversation in a way that doesn't marginalize or make people feel that the full scholarly contributions don't matter. This is just part of the picture. But we think all benefit from funded research. It speaks to the quality and the reputation of your scholarship. It uh, provides you um, personal success. It advances the reputation of the university and it enables you more autonomy in what you can do when you have the access to these additional resources. So this is something we have to focus on and we'll continue to emphasize increasing our externally funded research and creative activity. What are some of the investments in the area of research we plan for this year? We did announce the 25 endowed professorships um, uh, as we did for teaching excellence. We're going to continue to invest in infrastructure. Uh, we do have the advantage that in spite of our budget cuts, our higher education assistance funds are up considerably. We have about 48, 49 million dollars. Um, that's going to go into all colleges. Uh, we received significant gifts in the past year for the Majin Theater, and that's ongoing. The Experimental Science Building is under construction. And um, you're, going, you're going to hear about uh, campaigns in various colleges where they'll be seeking additional resources, but not only for infrastructure, but for scholarships. And I probably should make, emphasize a point there. When I mention raising 200 million for scholarships, that money is not intended to be centrally deposited. That is to complement ongoing initiatives for interest in engineering and arts and sciences and VPA. And we'll be working centrally to support those initiatives and that's, where, uh, and that's how those funds will be distributed. In the last three years, we have put six million dollars into graduate support. But our stipends are still not as competitive as they need to be and we'll continue to support graduate enrollment. And then as I turn to the third priority, um, this relates to how we apply our scholarship, our creative activity, and how it's engaged in the community in a very broad sense. So um, we want to make sure that what we do matters. And it matters in terms of the social fabric of the state, our community, it leads to economic development. We need to build capacity within our faculty and staff to do this kind of work. Um, and that means that people must be given credit for this. And in some ways, it's going to take a change of culture when you get into the various departmental cultures. Uh, and then we also want to remain very connected to our community. We have a great relationship with this, uh, the city. And an example of that, this is what I meant to begin with, is that project on 19th Street. <laughs> so um, Liz Polk came up to me. Is Liz here? There she is. Um, so we had a reception last week to thank everybody who worked on this strategic plan. And she came up to me, and this will come back to, to engagement with the city in a minute, and she said, when are you going to finish that golf cart path you're building? And I said, I don't know what you're talking about. She goes, yeah, you're building that path for golf carts so rich donors can drive around the campus and see it. <laughs> I go, no, that isn't. It's for biking, it's for traveling. A couple points. You can never communicate enough. And the thing, the, to think that we would do that, well, we're not. In fact, I made a joke. I said, really, it's not for golf carts. It's for ricochets and faculty and staff are going to pull rich donors around the campus. <laughs> Maybe somebody else suggested that. Um, but this is why I'm here today. In spite of what the message you may convey, you need to keep working at it and working at it. And that example is a collaboration. It really started under the leadership of Chancellor Duncan between the Texas Department of Transportation, Texas Tech, and the city. Um, the great majority of that project is being funded by the Texas Department of Transportation. We're responsible for the plants that we'll put around the path and in the median. But it will be a beautification project. 
it's just one of those examples of where you can engage the community in a way that all benefit. And finally, um, I want to close with some data that, I, that I, I would like to state makes a case that to be in the top 50 of the Carnegie Public R1 schools is a realistic and attainable goal, certainly by 2025. So there are many different metrics one could look at, but what, I've, what I'm showing you here, oh, an in investment, I'm sorry, I skipped that. Dad gummit. Can you fix that, Chris? <laughs> I got off track. <laughs> Go to the one on investments for engaged scholarship. Thank you. So well, where will we be investing in terms of that third priority? We, will pro we want to provide greater recognition and rewards for faculty and staff who do engage in this kind of activity, enhance administrative support, um, there's a lot of data that has to be collected and monitored. It doesn't mean adding more administrators, but you will see announcement about that in the coming week or so. And then also we want to continue to increase entrepreneurial activities, opportunities for students and faculty and support of the Innovation Hub and the Research Park. The Innovation Hub and Research Park under the direction of Kimberly Graham is essential to this whole conversation about engagement with the community, economic development, and in many ways, the impact of our research. And that is going to be an increasing priority as we go forward. Now finally, so here what you see is a number of metrics. We looked at the, the 81 schools that are in the Carnegie um, uh, Tier 1 class, 81 publics. There's 115 altogether. We took the average of these institutions' performance over a three-year period. And so there's always a lag in this data. But if you look at, say, enrollment, we are bigger than most schools. This actually negatively impacts us in such rankings like US News and World Report that are based on selectivity and resources. Uh, our graduate program is large. Green means we're better or bigger than the bottom quartile. That would be schools 80 through 60. Um, we're awarding a lot more doctorates. Our graduation rate is better. Those are good schools. And their six-year rate is 54%. Nationally, it's 42. Um, our SAT is not what we want it to be, but it's competitive. If you look at national merit scholars, it shows an average of five, because this data only goes through 2015. La this year, 16, last year, 15, and year before, seven. That's an average of 11. So you see we're very comparable to that third quartile. Um, we're also very competitive in terms of top 10 and top 25%. There's one mistake here that 21,735 should be red because we're more expensive than that bottom quartile by a modest amount. But the fact, but what it shows you is, in terms of the student characteristics, Texas Tech performs better than the bottom quartile. That would suggest that somewhere we're in there somewhere between 40 to 60. Let's look at things that relate to faculty activity. Salaries. Um, and I know people, I see people shaking their head out there already. They go, where do you get these numbers? <laughs> Well, it's, this is what is reported to iPad, averages. Averages can be very misleading. But you see, we pay, uh, at a, we have reasonable compensation when you look at these average values above the bottom quartile or below the next quartile. But once you get into that top half of those publics, we are not competitive. They're way above us. Um, so this is, I, I do want to announce that we will. I mean, this is something we have to address additional support for faculty and staff. We know that. We will be announcing a 2% merit pay in January. We wanted to wait until we got through this budget, and uh, that will be funded through our increased student credit hour. I know 2% is, you might, well, there you go again, but um, it does represent the fact that we're very cognizant of the need to increase faculty support. And 
the most effective way for doing this in a lot of cases is collaboration with the colleges as cases come up. And um, that's something we will be paying a lot of attention to. If you look at our student faculty ratio, and that was on the previous slide, um, we, we have a lot of, uh, I'm proud of the fact that we don't employ a lot of part-time instructors as most schools do. As you see, there are 86% of our instructional faculty are full-time. We have five National Academy members. We're in the midst of recruiting National Science, members of the National Academy of Science right now. Um, we'll see what happens. We have five, but that's an average. So you see we are, we're comparable to what you see in the third quartile. Uh, if you look at faculty awards, these are awards that the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board uses and also the Center for Measuring University Performance. Those are very substantial awards and we're, it speaks to the quality of our faculty. Where we really fall off to the chart there, you see, is in federal research expenditures. So that will be, a, that is, will be a big focus of our new VPR, Joe Hebert. He will also have uh, an important role in say in how we uh, strategically allocate resources for the hires that I mentioned earlier using National Research University funds. So um, I do believe if you look at this, you would see that to be top 50 by 2025 is a reasonable goal, and that's a goal that we should aspire to. And um, but I want to close with an email I got from a faculty member, uh, and I asked him if I could read this, Dustin Benham. He's a professor in law, and at that reception the other day, I asked anybody there to send me ideas and suggestions. I plagiarized a lot of what they sent me in this presentation. <laughs> but uh, Dustin wrote a very moving note, and uh, I think it says a lot. Um, so uh, Dustin um, came from a very difficult family. He was, his mother was 20 when he was born, he was very poor. Uh, he, was born, he, he said, I was born in poverty, and I won't go into the details, but believe me, it was difficult family circumstances. And he said, um, Texas Tech is a place that transforms lives and empowers people. And he mentions, I had a philosophy professor who inspired me that first semester. I took the course because philosophy sounded cool. So Mark Webb, don't get the big head there. <laughs> I ended up majoring in philosophy and graduated summa cum laude. He went on to law school and came back to, and became, he's now a faculty member at Tech. And if you would read his rest of his story, he's living his dream. Him and his family live in a neighborhood he always wanted to live in, Tech Terrace. <laughs> but it's, it's really touching. But he wrote, Texas Tech elevated the trajectory of my life and has given me and my family opportunities that I still can't fully believe. And I know from firsthand experience as a professor that it continues to do this for hundreds, if not thousands of people like me. And he went on to state something that he finds disturbing when he's in these conversations. He says, I find it disturbing when one poses the false binary. Are we a teaching school or a research school? The truth is that Texas Tech, these are his words, cannot be a truly great teaching school with broad access and quality services unless we thrive as a research institution. The two are inextricably intertwined in modern higher education. And so I believe that is what Texas Tech is about. If you go back to that video when it says this is a special place, to think that you elevate the trajectory of one lives, what a noble cause that is, and believe me, you do it. So our goal is to achieve those benchmarks that give us credibility when we say we are a top 50 national research university that makes a difference and promotes the success of students. Um, that gives, that enhances the value of the degrees we award. It makes us a more attractive institution to students, to faculty who are here, and to faculty who may come here, to staff that work here. It also gives greater pride to our alumni. So that's what we'll work on, and I thank you very much for all you do, sincerely, and I'll be willing to take any questions, and I want to thank you for not behaving 
as the people at Oregon did. Does anybody know what happened there? <laughs> well, the president tried to give his state of address and they shouted him down and he had to give up. <laughs> but people don't do that at Texas Tech. So I'll be glad to take any questions. Ram. So Ram is asking, all of these achievements are, uh, uh, are made through uh, a shared, uh, uh, you know, a shared vision, shared activity. Uh, I think you have to always understand, you know, of course, that's what universities are built on, the whole concept of shared governance. Some people do have to lead. Sometimes decisions are made that not everybody agrees with. So th the challenge is always to be as, to communicate as well as you can, to be respectful, and to always recognize the collective wisdom that resides on the campus. And um, we have our ups and downs. Um, I, I believe that's very important. At the same time, um, I think um, we have to be um, understanding of the fact that some people have visions of certain ways to do it. Um, but I think you know that I'm sensitive to that. Uh, at the same time, trying to be respectful of how units run their programs. We'll continue to work on that. I, I don't think, uh, I don't minimize that, but um, I don't think those issues are the greatest impediment to certain areas of performance at the university. But, but it does matter, it does affect morale, and that's an important issue. We want people to like the working environment to feel uh, that, that what they say and do matters. Would you like me to do a dance? <laughs> no. Any other question about any other issues? Okay. Well, thank you so much for being here. I do appreciate the chance to speak to you.